Channel 2 Boston, public television for New England. Local broadcast of the Nightly Business Report is made possible in part by a grant from the Boston office of Touche Ross, the international public accounting firm providing a broad range of professional services in auditing, tax, and consulting. In Washington, an Argentinian official gives details of the debt repayment agreement reached between his country and foreign banks. In Hammond, Indiana, unemployed construction workers are put back on the job as their union becomes a developer. And Charles Schultz discusses whether the nation's economy will be shifting into a lower gear for the rest of this year. Those and other stories on the Nightly Business Report. With Del Frank, Linda O'Brien, and Paul Kangas. Brought to you by Digital Equipment Corporation, the world's second largest computer company, providing computer solutions for professionals from professionals. Pacific Telesis Group, including Pacific Bell and the Pactel companies, leading the way in the information age. And public television stations throughout the nation. Now, the nightly business report. Good evening, everyone. In a sign that economic activity may be about to slow down, the Commerce Department reports the index of leading economic indicators fell by one-tenth of one percent last month. And if that number is not revised upward, it will mark the first downward move in the barometer of future econo economic trends in nearly two years. Of the individual indicators that make up the index, six showed negative movement in May, led by a decline in the length of the average work week. Other negative indicators were stock and raw materials prices, building permits, the formation of new businesses, and the pace of deliveries. Four indicators showed improvement, orders for plant and equipment, the money supply, orders for consumer goods, and new claims for unemployment benefits. Economist Eric Heinemann told New York co correspondent Neil Cavuto that the drop in the index is being viewed on Wall Street as an encouraging development. The financial community uh, is going to be um, comforted, I suppose would be a good word, uh, by this information. It uh, really strongly confirms the idea that there is very little short-run danger of any overheating in the economy. And that's basically good news for the financial community, which is worried about a new credit squeeze, more pressure on uh, interest rates from the Federal Reserve, and the threat of new inflation. I think that, that uh, we've got some additional information here which suggests that's not going to happen. Heinemann said the drop in the index of leading economic indicators means there's every reason to believe that interest rates will level off near their current levels. Linda? Also falling in May were sales of new single-family houses, which declined 4.4% from April levels. It was the third month in a row that new home sales declined, and it brought sales below last year's levels to an annual rate of 612,000 units. But while home sales were down in May, home prices went up, with the average price of a new home rising above $100,000 for the first time to $101,000. Economist Arnold Moskowitz of Dean Witter Reynolds said the continuing decline in housing sales is a sure sign that sales of other items will also decline in the coming months. Paul? For the host of nervous Wall Street Nellies who have been living in fear that the economy was in the process of overheating and that as a result interest rates would boil up to Jimmy Carter levels, that news of the first decline in leading economic indicators in nearly two years, along with the second straight monthly drop in home sales, should have put them a little more at ease. So should have yesterday's post-market report of a welcome $3.1 billion drop in the nation's basic money supply. But did this long-awaited evidence that the economy was slowing down to a more sustainable pace help the stock market follow through on the nice rally that sent the Dow Industrial Average to a closing gain of nearly 10 points yesterday? The answer, I'm happy to say, was an emphatic yes. And the Dow advanced another nine and three-quarter points by the end of the first hour of big board trading this morning. What's more, stocks posting gains took a solid seven to four lead over losers, while opening hour volume perked up 21 and three-quarter million shares from only 17 and three-quarter million yesterday. 
The market held on to its early gains quite impressively over the mid-session hours, getting some help from a White House spokesman and Commerce Secretary Baldridge, who said the decline in the May leading indicators was nothing to worry about, but instead improves the chances for keeping inflation well under control for some time to come. At 1 o'clock, then, the industrial average was still up about 9 and 3 quarter points, and gainers led losers by an 8 to 5 margin. Some institutions began to buy in mid-afternoon out of fear that they might miss a strong summer rally, and this pushed the Dow to a 13-point gain around 2 o'clock. A pickup in takeover speculation also gave the upturn some spunk, but eventually a little profit-taking appeared, which was normal after two days of higher prices. At 3 o'clock, the industrial average backed down to about a 10 and 3 quarter point gain, but winners st uh, still led losers 8 to 5. Three weekend selling pressures took a little more glow off the rally in the final hour as the Dow Industrial Average managed to salvage a closing gain of only 5.85 at 1132.40. And for the week, it was up just 1.33. An overall advance of 27.55 in June, however, it made it the best month of the year so far, but the second quarter still saw the Dow a net loser of 32 and one half points. Going back and reviewing some of the aver other averages today, the transport's up one and a third points. The utilities had a big move up, even though the bond market moved down. And then fractional gains in all the broadly based indexes. I'll be back shortly with a complete look at stocks, but now let's see what happened to the precious metals and major currencies today. Argentina today announced an agreement with its bank lenders that provides for the payment of overdue interest on the nation's $43.6 billion in foreign debts. That arrangement, coming just before tomorrow's deadline, keeps U.S. banks with loans to Argentina from having to write off the unpaid loans as non-performing and to deduct them from their second quarter earnings. The agreement itself provides for Argentina to supply $225 million of the funds owed from its own reserves with the banks coming up with a 45-day loan to cover the remaining $125 million in back interest. Argentina's economic counselor in Washington says that'll bring the nation up to date on its interest payments. The, the case is that we are about to, to come to a satisfactory conclusion at the end of this, of this quarter. I mean, there is, uh, uh, in principle, the possibility that we have today one arrangement which is agreeable for us and which is agreeable for the banks which are the two parties involved in this in this operation and if we agree on that th that's what it takes Kirana Diaz said that Argentina is also closer to working out an overall refinancing package with the International Monetary Fund that would cover all of that nation's foreign debt on Capitol Hill, Congress today approved a $53 billion increase in the federal debt ceiling, which will allow the government to borrow enough money to pay its bills through August. Only yesterday, the House rejected raising the debt limit in an attempt to force Senate conferees to agree to a lower defense spending level. Although the House reversed itself today, it approved the hike in the debt ceiling by only a four-vote margin. As we reported earlier in this program, sales of new homes last month ran behind last year's pace. Now, the slowdown is hurting construction workers in Hammond, Indiana. But Leslie Nickel of our Chicago Bureau reports that one local organization is hammering away at their problem. It is fair to say that Hammond, Indiana is a city that has seen better days. The domestic steel industry has lost a lot of its former sales to foreign steel producers. That decline has had a ripple effect on business here. The local carpenters union has 600 members. 200 of them are out of work. Five years ago, everyone was working in the building trades. Ten years ago? Uh, there, too. Except for a small mini-recession in between, uh, we've never experienced anything this difficult. So to put carpenters back to work, this local is making an unprecedented move. Local 599 is trying to become the employer it usually works for. More specifically, the union is becoming a developer. This 50-acre tract of land was to be developed in the late 70s. Streets were laid out, sewers installed, but when the Hammond economy dipped, the project was abandoned. The city and some local lenders were left with a lot of land and sewers and nothing to do with it. And that's where this union comes in. 
armed with city, state, and federal assistance, Local 599 is in the process of buying and developing it. Business agent Bob Farkas compares the move to workers who buy a company to avoid losing their jobs. He figures the project that would erect hundreds of single and multifamily homes here should put most of the union's members back to work. We estimate that there's 300 carpenter hours in each living unit that will be built there. And there's approximately 480 or 500 living units uh, uh, going to be built. And then uh, we're talking about 150,000 man hours of just carpenters. While there is still no guarantee that there will be a market for the new homes, everyone involved is behind the project. The city is backing it with tax relief to home buyers, and union members could not be more enthusiastic. Yeah, we've got uh, a lot of fellows that have uh, been out of work. It's been kind of a lean time, and this will give uh, us an opportunity to uh, get some guys back to work, and uh, I just think it's good for the community, too. In Indiana, Leslie Nickel for the Nightly Business Report. Well, Wolf and Wall Street have found a new home in the past two days. Let's go at these closing averages again, and we see a lot of plus signs with the Dow Industrials up 585 on the day, and uh, good gains all the rest of the way down the line. Trading volume up considerably from yesterday's pace, uh, you know, indicating some institutional involvement. Up volume well ahead of down volume. And uh, 888 issues closed higher on the big board, 727 down. Still only 15 new highs for the year and 54 new lows. Topping the active list on a whopping three and a quarter million shares, electronic data systems up one half. Of course, yesterday the company agreed to uh, be bought out by General Motors for $44 a share cash. AT&T edged up three-eighths today, well over 17 again. Continental Group up five-eighths. It's considered a buyout candidate, somewhere around $50 to $55 a share. Burroughs trading ex-dividend, a nice move up, one and three-eighths. And IBM fifth in activity gained one half. AT&T preferred A stock lost a point today. Exxon was up five eighths. American Express gained seven eighths. Greyhound gaining three quarters. And Bank America uh, up three eighths of a point yesterday. The Supreme Court said that it can buy out the largest discount broker in America, Charles Schwab and Company. Digital equipment. There were uh, pockets of weakness in the high tech sector. It was down one and three quarters today. Dupont edged up three quarters. GM gained three eighths. Mohawk Data up seven eighths. Investor Asher Edelman said he owned seven percent of Mohawk. Owens Illinois up a point. Favorable comments in the Wa Wall Street Journal's heard on the street column today, saying Owens Illinois is an attractive buyout candidate at much higher than market prices. St. Regis down a half after the close yesterday. Rupert Murdoch said he owns five point uh, five point six percent of St. Regis, but is not interested in seeking control. Warner Communications a good move up nearly two points today but the company could not explain the strength playboy enterprises up one and five eighths one of the best percentage movers on the upside the company didn't know why same story with integrated resources up one and three quarters dorsey corp up one and seven eighths on the news that Sh shamrock associates has increased its ownership to 27.7 percent adams millis the big loser of the day down one and a half recently the company forecast a drop in second quarter earnings Arkla, which gained three points yesterday on takeover speculation, giving about half of that back on profit taking today. And Coastal Corp was mentioned as a possible suitor of Arkla, and today it was down one and three eighths. Yesterday, Coastal also said it expects lower second quarter earnings. Over in the American Exchange, a two thirds point gain in the index, but for the week overall, the index was down 1.93. Trading volume up about a million shares today on the curb, and advances led losers by almost a three to two margin. Data products led the active list, rising five eighths. Then a Commercial al uh, Alliance. Uh, was unchanged today after a big gain yesterday. It's received a uh, tender offer somewhere between $18 and $22 a share, depending on how much the company earns. Wang Labs was uh, unchanged today. Restaurant Associates up 7 eighths. Dome Petroleum showed no change. Diagnostic Retrieval Systems A stock, the best percentage gainer, up one and an eighth on the curb. The biggest percentage loser, Imperial Industries, down a quarter. Over the counter trading, and the composite index, a one and a third point gain, trading volume up a little bit from yesterday's pace, and gainers led losers by a nine to five ratio. Apple Computer topped the active list, edging up an eighth, no change in Intel, American International Group holding steady. Digital Switch up five eighths, MCI Communications fifth in activity, down an eighth. Uh, Mycom Systems was off a half. Color Tile Incorporated gained three eighths. Daisy Systems up one quarter. Lynn Broadcasting gained a half. Tenth in NASDAQ volume, the price company, no change. American Appraisal Association has received a friendly takeover bid at $21 a share from RLM Investments. Data packaging up a point. Uh, the company reported sharply higher second quarter earnings, 27 cents versus last year's one cent. Interdyne down one and an eighth. The company says that it'll be, uh, there'll be some delay in shipments of some of its disk drives due to engineering problems. 
FMC was halted at 48 and 5 eighths, up a little over a point on the news. It'll uh, make a tender offer for $6 million of its own share, somewhere between $51 and $54 a share. Home Setters of America halted at that price. It has been uh, bid for $11 a share on a buyout from Kmart. And H. Miller & Sons, no change right near the close. Lennar announced it'll pay $24 a share on a buyout of H. Miller & Sons. Well, despite today's report showing a slowdown in the economy, the bond market moved lower in early trading to the surprise of many, particularly since this week's money supply report was down too. The problem seemed to be nearly a one-point rise in the Fed funds rate, along with concern as to how well the remaining $9.5 billion uh, in quarterly Treasury refunding would go next week. And that'll, of course, be a four-day week due to the 4th of July holiday on Wednesday. Let's look at the long-term government bond market. Nearly a half-point loss in these Treasuries of 2014 a quarter point loss in the American Telephone uh, Corporates of 1990, and an eighth point loss in these Intermountain Power Agency uh, municipals. And the Fed funds rate, as you see, closed at the high of the day, 11.5%. That's the Wall Street wrap-up. Linda? After a two-year struggle, the Senate is expected tonight to give final congressional approval to an overhaul of the nation's bankruptcy laws. The House of Representatives today passed the bankruptcy bill on a unanimous vote after reaching a compromise on a key provision that prohibits bankrupt companies from breaking their contracts with employees without court approval. The bill would also protect farmers when grain elevator operators go bankrupt, and it would make it more difficult for consumers to escape all debts by declaring bankruptcy. In Washington, Interior Secretary William Clark today urged Congress not to renew bans on offshore drilling along the Massachusetts and California coasts. Clark said those bans should be reserved for emergency situations, and worked out through negotiations between the Interior Department and Congress. On a related matter, Clark said the United States will accept the International Court of Justice's forthcoming ruling on its territorial dispute with Canada regarding offshore sites in the North Atlantic. My guest market monitor this week is Elaine Garzarelli, Managing Director and Quantitative Strategist for the brokerage firm of A.G. Becker Paribas. She's with us in our New York studios tonight. Welcome to the Nightly Business Report, Elaine. Thank you, Paul. This is your first uh, visit with us, and certainly uh, the title uh, Managing Director is impressive enough, but your other title, Quantitative Strategist, makes that pale by comparison. What does a quantitative strategist do? Well, basically, uh, Paul, what I am is a mathematical economist. Uh, another word for me is actually econometrician. And uh, what I've been doing over the last 12 years is actually trying to relate the total economy to financial markets, especially the stock market. So over these 12 years, I've actually developed relationships mathematically uh, to project earnings for the uh, stock market and then the direction of stock prices and also earnings of industry groups. Well, what does this break down to now for the future direction of stock prices? That's the obvious question. It sure is. Well, I think uh, basically what we have to talk about first is the economy because uh, if uh, the economy has a certain direction, uh, to it, then I can relate that to the stock market. And what my work actually shows right now is that the economy is beginning to slow down. And we've seen some real evidence of this today, even mm. in the leading indicators. Definitely. Um, and uh, with the slowdown, I think that the increase in interest rates that we've seen is now going to stop. And we're actually going to have a decline in in interest rates from now until the end of the year. Uh, the slowdown is also healthy in that it will keep inflation below 6% throughout all of 1984. Uh, it'll also keep earnings in a range of about a 21% increase this year and another 6% next year. Uh, and uh, I don't see a recession developing at all until 1986, maybe by the fourth quarter or 1987. So this is an actual uh, expansion that's going to be quite a long time. So this should have a very salubrious effect upon stock prices. How optimistic are you, let's say, in terms of the Dow Industrial Average? Well, the, the point right here is I think that we're in a correction in the market. The correction is similar to corrections that we've had in the post-war period. We've had actually eight serious corrections in the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, five of those eight were associated with a slowdown in economic activity that actually turned into down corporate profits and a recession. But three of those markets actually did not have a recession develop, only a slowdown in the economy. And those corrections were 1962, 1966, and 1977. I think this correction is similar to those periods. And the interesting thing is, Paul, that we're almost finished with it. I think we're not finished yet. I think we have a, maybe another 5 to 10% down, and then that's it. 
And what we have to look forward to right. after each of these is a rise in the market of about six months of a 20 to 25 percent gain over a short period of time. What industry groups do we look at to buy now? Okay, if you wanted to buy now, and uh, even though the averages might hit, uh, f might go further down, I would say some industries have already bottomed out. Mm -hmm. I would be aggressive buyers on weakness here of the retailing group, uh, the restaurant stocks, the aerospace stocks, the drug stocks, and the hospital management companies. All right, can we get specific within those groups, like the retailers? Okay, and the retailers, uh, Kmart is a very exciting company, and also, um, uh, I would say, uh, anything else that you find in the mass merchandising area. Okay. The department stores, I think, a little bit later. All right. And the other groups? Yep. Hospital management, uh, we like Humana. Uh, in the restaurant stocks, we like McDonald's. In the aerospace, Lockheed. Um, also, Tracor is a nice small company that should do very well. And um, I think in the drug area, we'd be going with Pfizer, Bristol & Myers, and another small one called Bolar. Very good. Uh, any groups to avoid, Elaine? Well, I'll tell you, I think that as the averages may fall further, I think what will lead it down will actually be the oil stocks. Okay. From my work, many of them are very overvalued at this point. All right. A refreshingly positive view. Elaine, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Paul. My guest market monitor, Elaine Garzarelli of A.G. Becker Paribas. Coming up, Charles Schultz says the economy may be losing some steam. The magazine Traffic World reports that executives of the Allegheny Corporation held secret talks with government officials and others before the company made its bid for Conrail, the government-owned railroad. The article concludes that the secret negotiations, along with the government's desire to speed the sale, enabled Allegheny to make one of the best bids for the rail system. A spokesperson for the Transportation Department said any company could get help in preparing a bid for Conrail and added that none of the 14 bids received can be considered a clear leader in that contest. The Agriculture Department reports that the prices farmers received for their goods fell seven-tenths of one percent in June. That was the second monthly drop in farm prices in a row, and it reflected declining prices for cattle, wheat, milk, eggs, and soybeans. Despite June's drop, farm prices were still 7.5 percent higher than they were in the same month last year. The conference board says its Help Wanted Index, which measures the volume of Help Wanted ads in major newspapers, rose slightly in May from the April levels. However, conference board economist Kenneth Goldstein noted the volume of job advertising was only 2% higher in May than it was in January, showing a dramatic slowdown in the improvement on the labor market. As a result, Goldstein predicted only minor improvement in unemployment rates this summer. Today's report on the May Index of Leading Economic Indicators suggests that the economy's growth will slow in coming months. In tonight's commentary, Brookings Institution Senior Fellow and former Presidential Advisor Charles Schultz gives us his perspective on the likelihood of an economic cooling-off period. According to the latest GNP statistics, the American economy continues to surge ahead, faster than almost anyone had expected. Indeed, some people have begun to worry that the recovery is proceeding so fast, it's starting to generate new inflationary pressures. For the near term, I think this view is wrong. Some of the recent good news on inflation, like the drop in consumer food prices, is likely to be temporary. But even after discounting such temporary factors, the trend in price inflation remains moderate. The underlying rate of inflation is probably running in the 4.5 to 5% range, and there's no evidence it's beginning to speed up. Wage inflation has moderated sharply in the past several years. And here also, the evidence shows no sign that any new speed-up is underway. Right now, there are still unemployed workers and excess plant capacity available. And the overvalued dollar makes it cheap to buy imports from abroad. 
These factors tend to keep the lid on wage and price increases. But the dollar is likely to weaken in the year ahead and imports become more expensive. And the American economy has been recovering so rapidly that our own unused resources are quickly being put back into production. Indeed, if contrary to most forecasters, the economy continues to recover at the same speed it did in the second quarter, then by the spring of next year, we could be entering the inflationary danger zone. And so the key question is whether the latest rise in interest rates engineered by the Federal Reserve has been large enough to slow the future momentum of recovery and bring it gradually back down to a long-term sustainable rate. I think that rate rise has been enough to do the job. But admittedly, it's a difficult and a close question that the Fed has to grapple with month by month as they make economic policy. This is Charles Schultz. And now with tonight's last word, here's Paul. We've heard of companies being forward-thinking or thinking big, but Coca-Cola is thinking up, not, not seven up, but up to the heavens for future business. Specifically, Coke President Donald Keough says he wants to put his company's soft drinks in vending machines aboard future space shuttles and space stations. Actually, that may not be such a bad idea. After the space shuttle's problems this week, a Coke just might give the astronaut a much-needed lift. I'll drink to that. That's it for this edition of the Nightly Business Report for Friday, June 29th. And for Linda, for Paul, for all of us on the Nightly Business Report, good night. The Nightly Business Report is brought to you by Pacific Telesis Group, including Pacific Bell and the Factel Companies, leading the way in the information age. Digital Equipment Corporation, the world's second largest computer company, providing computer solutions for professionals from professionals. And public television stations throughout the nation. Local broadcast of the Nightly Business Report is made possible in part by a grant from the Boston office of Touche Ross, the international public accounting firm providing a broad range of professional services in auditing, tax, and consulting.